I'm excited here because today I finally get to do a video about something I've been looking forward to for a really long time. This is my Compaq Portable. Now, this is not going to be an in-depth video about the Compaq Portable. This is going to be looking more at my Compaq Portable. Now, my Compaq Portable came fairly complete with the original documents, though these don't have the discs with them. But it did come with the original purchase receipt from November 1983, which we'll take a closer look at later. For now, let's get this open and take a look at what the Compaq Portable is. My Compaq Portable here is in impeccable condition, and I'm sure that's in part due to this wonderful padded case that I got it in. There was a leather version of this case available, but I suspect the padded one has been able to protect it longer because it's just made of softer materials. Let's go ahead and get this open. It just has zippers along these sides, and then you can pull the computer out. And there it is. Well, there's the bottom. This is actually the front, and it's rather unassuming looking until you take this panel off, which is revealed to be the keyboard, and then it becomes what I think is one of the best looking computers you can get. This doesn't look like it was put together. This looks like it was designed. I love the colors, the proportions, the spacing of everything. I just really like how the Compaq Portable looks. Now, back to taking a look at mine in particular here, we can see something a little interesting considering that I have the original purchase receipt. There are two floppy drives, but one of them is not like the other. These two drives are very clearly different. The latch is different between the two, the LED is a different size and at a different location, and the plastic is just a different color in general. This one I'm pretty sure is a tandem drive based on the clip style here, and there's a sticker under here that says the tracks per inch. And this one I'm guessing is a more generic drive. Now, this computer came with two floppy drives. I'm guessing that the store this computer was bought from was buying single drive configured compact portables and adding second drives at customer's request. That would make inventory a lot easier because they'd only need to keep one computer in stock and they'd probably make a little bit better margins on it if they installed the second drive rather than let Compaq do it. Speaking of the store this came from, let's go ahead and take a look at that original purchase receipt. Now, my Compaq Portable was purchased from CompuShop in Salt Lake City, Utah, and they have this lovely custom watermarked paper with the 70s computer font. This is, this is awesome. This is wonderful computer shop memorabilia type stuff. Now, interestingly, my computer was purchased in November 1983, eight months after this computer was introduced. I would say that's a fairly early model, although in 1984 they did start to release the Compaq Plus, uh, which had a hard drive option, but this was still for sale during that time. However, they were already giving out some pretty good discounts, at least CompuShop was, because this customer was buying the 128K and single drive model, getting the uh, double drive upgrade, but getting it for free. So their original purchase price for the computer, $29.95, with the extra drive was being reduced by the whole cost of the extra drive. That's a pretty good deal because that $525 floppy drive was an expensive adder. I'm not sure what the CDEX IBM training is. I'm guessing CDEX was some kind of special program that they likely got with this. I'm not sure, but for 70 bucks, getting that for free was a good deal as well. Now, their grand total came out to $3,167, which was a good deal, actually. And I think the computer shop was trying to tell them that here with these uh, little notes about the IBM PC. According to a Byte Magazine article from the same time in 1983, a similarly configured IBM PC would have been $3,735. So the nearly $600 price savings on the Compaq Portable compared to a pretty high spec PC would have been an enticing option when it came to buying a computer, and I'm sure that's why the sales reps wrote that on the sheet. And I think it's time to get to the point of this video, which is the keyboard. Now, this keyboard, when I first got this computer, was a survivor. It is a foam and foil key switch keyboard, which means that the keys are actuated by foam, and it was fully functional. But a single round of Planet X3 on here claimed the M and Enter keys because you have to press them so much during gameplay, and it just showed the weaknesses of the keyboard. So, I do need to repair it today. 
you know, I got so excited about this computer and working on it and showing it off today that I forgot to tell you what it actually is. So let me put in a floppy disk with DOS on it and fire it up and tell you what this thing really is. Although first I'll say that's not a compact portable copy of DOS. I do have the box for DOS, but I don't have that version of DOS. If you know where I could find a copy of compact DOS, I would love to get my hands on it. Now, what is the Compact Portable? The Compact Portable is a PC clone. This is essentially a portable version of the IBM 5150. It's an ISA card computer that uses an Intel 8088 processor, and it has 128 kilobyte of memory. And here we can see it loaded up DOS with no problems at all. Oh yeah, enter key doesn't really work right. <laughs> Yeah, see, this is why I have to fix it. Being a portable computer means it needs a display built in, so it has a 9 inch monochrome green phosphor CRT. Now, back to the keyboard. The Compact Portable's keyboard is pretty much a clone of the IBM PC's keyboard. They are both XT interface keyboards, and the layout of the keys was copied from the PC onto the Compact Portable. But there are two significant differences. The IBM Model F is a wonderful mechanical keyboard that is very reliable, whereas the Compact Portable is foam and foil and degrades over time. The other problem has to do with the interface. The IBM Model F is a detachable keyboard. The Compact Portable keyboard, though, is permanently wired into the case and is not removable, at least not externally. Now there are two ways to detach the keyboard. One is to open the keyboard itself and detach the cable from the board inside of the keyboard, which is definitely the easier way to go. And the other is to open up the computer and detach the cable from the motherboard, which I believe is somewhere back here. Now I haven't fully opened this thing and explored what condition it's in inside, so I kind of want to do it that way. And that'll also let me take a look at the whole cable as well. Now opening the compact portable seems kind of daunting at first. There are no screws. This would be the back of the computer when it's in the usable position. So there's nowhere to take the panels off. You just have these little slots and you might think that you're supposed to take a screwdriver and turn it in that slot. And that is very wrong. You don't want to do that. The easiest way to do this is to take two screwdrivers, feed one in and lift up, feed the next one in, lift up, and the first one will come loose. Just work your way along the case and you'll find that it just pops right up at the end. Very easy to get into once you know that little trick. And there's something else kind of cool in here. An unopened service agreement for this computer. This is still sealed in the lid. I kind of want to take a look at what's in there. All right, so let's check this out. Like I said, this is unopened, so I have no idea what's going to be in here. I don't think there is an opening anywhere on this, so I don't see a way of getting it out other than cutting it. So I'm going to do that. Now, there's some adhesive that got stuck on it on the inside. <clears throat> This sheet is full of interesting little tidbits here. So apparently this computer was owned by Arthouse Graphics. And this service, I believe, was an extension on the original warranty. So the we have the Compaq port 2 drives, the serial number 17997S, which does match the computer. Uh, looks like the service agreement was $153, but with tax, came out to $162 pretty good deal compared to how expensive the computer was. I don't know what CIAN system type A is. Maybe that's just a description of what kind of computer this is for their records. Uh, but the date that this agreement was signed is really interesting because it starts in 1988. This computer's from 1983. This computer was in use to the point where they were extending the warranty Five years later. Now, this isn't like right now, where you can use a computer from five years ago, install the current operating system, and notice effectively no changes. Technology was moving lightning quick in the mid to late 80s. 
this is crazy. This warranty was good until 1989. By the time this warranty was going into effect, the 386 was already out. Before this warranty ended, the 486 was released. This computer was a dinosaur back then, being used at a graphics house? What? This is, this is just weird and cool. I wonder if maybe this was originally being used for maybe some kind of graphics production and just transitioned over to general office work because that doesn't make any sense. But this is a really cool piece of history of this computer to have. Now, the fact that I had to unseal this means that this was the last service agreement that this company had on this computer. So it's kind of interesting that $153 was never used for the warranty service because it was still sealed. So even five years later, this computer was pretty reliable. This computer was probably open some point after production because some of the bolts have marks around the outside where they would have to fit a socket over them. So. At some point, this computer was opened. Maybe not during that final service agreement, though. While I was testing sockets to figure out what the right size driver for this thing is, I accidentally dropped one in there because those holes are huge, and I had to tip this around to get it back out. But a small little broken piece of plastic fell out, so something in there is uh, brittle and fragile now. So I'll want to open this up and figure out what has broken and if it needs re-secured. Well, I've already found my first minor problem. Uh, I heard something moving around and that's what made me look for that little red piece, which I think I can see an example of sort of down there. So uh, I'm getting closer to that, but these are the slots that hold the backs of the ISA cards in place because they're so long and this one is clearly missing. So I think that's going to be rattling around in there somewhere. I will want to find that so it's not just loose inside the computer. But uh, yeah, some of these are breaking. That one's broken off at the top. This one's not far behind. That one's probably gonna stay in place because it's just being held in by the display card. But uh, yeah, the plastics, oh, what, what is, oh. Oh, that's for the floppy cards. There's a short one there. So that, was, that was confusing for a moment. But um, it's looking like it's uh, not bad. Now, right there is the keyboard connector. So yeah, I was right. It's all the way at the back. That's just great. Um, and I'm also looking at this and I'm thinking this might be a second revision board because I'm only seeing the one switch bank. There might be another one hidden somewhere else in there. So that's a good thing um, because the, only the later revisions that came with BIOS version C are able to use uh, ISA cards that have a BIOS uh, ROM on them which would be necessary for something like an XT IDE. So I think I may have locked out that even though this is an earlier production model that it has uh, the second revision BIOS and board. This is also weird and I wonder if this is factory. This piece of aluminum that seems to be screwed underneath the video card that's holding down the floppy parallel card that it's just like a piece of scrapped aluminum pinned down there is that can't be stock can it this card looks like it's meant to have a hole here to mount well, like these have and every other card but this one has this little extra bracket that sticks up and it goes to the screw hole so i'm wondering if maybe this is not the original floppy card i don't know i haven't actually looked at other pictures of the inside of these but yeah that's really strange all right i'm going to try and get the floppy drives out of here so we can explore a little bit more in this thing Wow, the story just gets more complicated with this computer. Um, so, yes, this is a later revision board, but I don't think it came with it. These parts are all 1984 vintage on here, and this is missing the secondary switch right here. I think this thing had the complete motherboard replaced in it at some point, but that wasn't the end of the work. All right, here is the floppy controller from this thing, and just, wow, this is kind of interesting. So first off, this is wrong. I mean, that's not the back plate that should be on this thing. Well, the problem is, is that 
that's a standard one. And the compact portable is supposed to have a weird one. A weird one that looks like this. This is an original compact portable floppy controller with the strange mount plate like the video card has. So I can pull that over here and you can see that's what it should be like, but it doesn't have it. So clearly this is a replacement, but it's a compact branded replacement. That's kind of weird, isn't it? How is it a replacement that goes in the compact portable that's compact branded but has the wrong edge on it? Well, I think this is actually from a compact desk pro. The compact portable was released first and then the desk pro came out later as a more traditional desktop PC. So I bet this is a floppy controller for the desk pro which would have had normal XT style mounts on there for ISA cards. So this is a desk pro floppy controller. Okay, that's fine, it works, it's compact, it's all within the family, so whatever. Um, there is one annoyance here, that this is the wrong backplate. Now, interestingly, I think that it could maybe have had this plate moved over, but it's really hard to tell where the position of these screws are. I'm not sure if this is at the same point where this is, so it may have been possible to put the original backplate on here, but I don't know. So the computer shop should have tried that. I don't know if they did and it just didn't fit, but that would have fixed the problem. They wouldn't have had to use that piece of scrap aluminum to hold this in place. Whatever. Now, another interesting thing about this card is when it was put in there. This chip is copyright 86, but it was produced in 87. The oldest chip I was able to find on here quickly was 88 in the 15th week, which would have been just before the warranty was re-signed on this thing. So their last warranty before the current one that's in the case got them a whole floppy controller. Apparently the service agreements were paying out, so that explains why they kept renewing it every year. That got them a floppy controller, it probably got them that motherboard, so yeah, it made sense to keep doing that for five years after the computer was relevant, because apparently the one they bought was a heap of junk and it just kept having things fail. Or maybe their service center sucked at identifying and repairing problems and they were just throwing parts at it. It's hard to say, but I know I have a little hodgepodge computer here, so... Uh, it's not as complete and original as I thought, now that I get deeper into it. Alright, I found an example of the broken red piece here. We can see that this is a standoff that holds one of the CRT boards in there, and the tip inside is clearly the same as this. So these were just little inserts to hold the board in place. Now, it's not good that that's broken on there, but that I can see some that are still intact, and I see others in there that are still good. That tells me that I probably don't need to worry about that, that it wasn't just a couple parts holding it on, so I'm probably good for now, but if I hear more stuff rattling around in here, I need to be suspicious of that. Now that I'm more familiar with this thing's uh, long and troubled service history, I'm not as concerned about this card support being missing. The chances are good that when they were replacing the floppy controller or just doing anything on here, that this broke, and, well, maybe not this one, maybe that one, and they just moved it over as a substitute for one of the ones that they actually needed. So, really, this being missing isn't a problem. I've moved this around now that I have it slightly open and listened and looked for stuff that was loose and couldn't see or hear anything, so I don't think it's in here. I think it is long gone. So, I, I'm not that concerned about this now. So that means it's time to move on to the keyboard. And uh, well, looking at this, this whole part of the cage is riveted in place. So I don't really like the idea of trying to get to that connector. Well, more specifically, I don't like the idea of trying to plug it back in because I could probably reach in there and unplug it, but plugging it back in is gonna be a nightmare. So I'm just gonna disassemble the keyboard side and uh, we'll work on it from there. One more thing for grins and giggles, I took a look at the date codes on the display adapter here and the oldest part I could find was 8322. So this might be one of the only original parts left in this computer, aside from drive A and possibly the CRT. Although if they were actually carrying this thing around, who knows, they may have dropped it and cracked it. So that could even be new. I couldn't find a date code on the CRT, so I don't know. But yeah, at least this part is an original part to this computer, unlike almost everything else. Now onto the keyboard, and I'm going to be repairing this using Texelex foam and foil keypad replacements. Now, I want to say something about this. Um, I did actually buy this, this was not provided to me. So what I'm about to say is my own opinion. I really like Texelex stuff. 
They have a TI-99 4A controller adapter, PC Junior breakout boards, just they have a lot of really cool stuff. So I'm a big fan of their products. I really like what they do. So I'm glad that they still have these available. And I wanted to say thank you for having these out there. It might be possible for me to make these on my own, but frankly, I would probably spend more in materials trying to get these parts made than it would just cost me to have bought these. So. I wanted to say thank you for having these out there. So now let's go ahead and start taking apart the keyboard. The keyboard's really disassembled, to easy to disassemble. Um, there's just a couple of Phillips screws around the outside. Mine's missing one. So pff, probably at some point this thing's nightmarish repair history. Either the keyboard was replaced or had to be worked on, who knows. But yeah, really easy to get into here. Well, I was gonna say, based on all the chips in here, it looks like this is the original keyboard, but then the bottom of the keyboard case had to go and say January 31st, 1985. So this was replaced at some point as well. <laughs> Man, this is, this computer is just a nightmare of repairs. Wow, I can't believe they stuck with it for so long. Now, oh, the inner board, January or June 17th, 83. Oh man, so maybe it was just the bottom. Maybe they dropped it at some point. The bottom had to be replaced. Who knows? It probably would have been cheaper to order just the plastic components, but yeah. Also, obviously this keyboard's filthy. As I continue on here, I'm going to take off the keycaps and I'll just go soak them in some dishwater to clean this. Oh, yeah. Time to keep moving on though. The bottom plate here does remove with screws, but we're a little bit away from that, so. Yep, time to keep pushing on. I have the keys off and we can see the foam and foil pads here. Interestingly, the springs on mine are glued down so they don't really come off. So that's kind of strange and I wasn't expecting that. Um, but I wanted to give you a heads up, the space bar is absolutely terrifying to remove. It has these little plastic black things stuck in the main key that go over this that just it really seems like when you pull it out that these ripped off of here and just broke the plastic. So that's not going to be fun to put back together. Um, outside of that, though, I think I'm ready to start replacing these. Now, these actually look kind of different than what I was expecting. I don't know. Maybe these have been replaced before. That'd be a bit strange. But uh, yeah, they are clearly falling apart. <laughs> yeah, so... Time for some new ones. Now, I haven't opened the tech select ones yet, so let's go ahead and do that and see what they look like. Oh, yeah, these are going to work fantastically. I didn't know if they came with the uh, rigid piece on the other side or not, but they definitely do. So, yeah, these, these, these are going to be good. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um... Time to pull out all of those. Yay. Now that I have the pads out, I thought I'd show you that the Texelac replacements are a really good substitute of those pads. They're, they look every bit as original as those do, although <laughs> after I flipped it over and Squish that one a little bit. We can see that. Oh, yeah, it just totally crushed. Yeah, so now it's time to put uh, these new ones in and go ahead and reassemble the keyboard. I'm going to go ahead and stop the time lapse here and just do this off camera because this really takes a lot more concentration than you would think because these just don't go in easily. You really have to work to snap all four corners of this hard pad in there in place. I mean, let me just go ahead and show you 
here, you have to snap each one down, and it's feisty. One. Two. That one's in, and that one's in. So you have to really concentrate and go through on each one of these pads and do this, or else they're not going to be in there straight. And that's a problem, because you really need the good alignment. So, yeah, this takes a real amount of concentration. This is not a process you can just fly through. So, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just finish this off camera. Whew, okay, I'm finally done putting in all the foam foil pads. So I found it best to just go through and check all four sides of each one of these individually with the poker so I know that they're all in there and fully attached because they really aren't just push them in with your finger and leave it. They, they need to be fully attached. Um, so now they are though, they're all flat and even and I'm ready to reassemble the keyboard. So I'm gonna start with the spacebar key because it's got this weird uh, support beam thing going across that makes it level. So let's try and work that in there. Unfortunately, that's one of the few keys where the spring came off. So I have to try and align that, but that won't be too bad. I also have all my nice clean keys now. Actually, it goes the other way, doesn't it? That was really easy to put back together. You just have to slide the support beam back and forth and you'll fit it in the little slots where the keys connect. Well, now that that one's back in, I just need to put the rest of the keys back on. All right, all the keys are in and it's looking pretty good. I'm happy with how it feels. The keys all seem right. This is kind of a good test of how they'll feel after it's been reassembled because these foam pads stick down and this is just pushing against my ESD mat here. So yeah, um, the keys I think are slightly yellowed, but after cleaning them, they look so much better that I don't think I'm going to feel all that tempted to try and ever retro bright these. Maybe later, I don't know. Um, outside of the case, it looks pretty good, but once I put the frame back on, let's see here, I haven't done this yet. Yeah, it's a little more obvious that way, but it, I still don't think it's that bad, so. All right, let's uh, go ahead and put it back together now. All right, that's it. The keyboard and computer are fully reassembled, which means it's time to try and test it out. Okay, it booted up before, that's not new. Keyboard is working. Oh yeah. All right, um, let's go ahead and just try something out. So let's play a game on it and take advantage of one of the cool features that this computer has, and that is the unusual graphics card. Now, let's see if I can make this work. Actually, this isn't a full version of DOS here, so I don't think I'm going to have the mode command. Yeah, so I can't really demonstrate that. Um, I'm going to do a more feature-oriented video about this computer later, and I'll go into some of the cool stuff then, um, but just for reference, this computer's display adapter and the monitor connection are able to do both monochrome and color displays, CGA specifically. So we're gonna go ahead and switch to drive B here and launch VET. Program too big to fit in memory. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> ah, yeah. I forgot about the dark days of my 5150 not having the Tecmara captain, so back to Jeopardy! There we go, colors, you can see the gradients. Well, not gradients, differences.
Ugh. Let me shut that off. I'm at the point where that music isn't the Jeopardy theme anymore. It's the your computer sucks theme and that's all it can run. Alright. Do one player. Name's Fred. Would you like a new character? Yeah, that guy's weird. There we go. Alright. But hey, it is clearly working. It is really nice that this has the all-in-one graphics card that just makes it so much more useful. But that's pretty much it. Uh, the keyboard is clearly fully functional. We can go ahead and restart. But I am very happy with how this has turned out. I have not yet tested all the keys, but I've tested a majority of them. We can just do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Yeah, it's working very well. I'm super happy with this repair. I am also very happy that TechSelect makes those parts available. It's really nice to be able to just get one of these back up and running. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this look at my Compaq Portable and its surprisingly tumultuous repair history. <laughs> I'm glad I could contribute that lineage for it uh, by having to rebuild the keyboard. But uh, that's it for the moment. If you guys want to support the channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, that's it. I'll see you next time. Well, I guess I do have another game that doesn't need a ton of RAM.